stars for this, it should be in the membrane because it is a membrane insoluble. It cannot pass through the membrane directly because it is not uh, soluble in membrane and also it is water soluble in MHA. So you have to remember in both directions and both versions of the same thing. The peptide hormones, the characteristic number water soluble and they are membrane insoluble. So in other words, I'll draw a picture like this and this is nucleus and this is the peptide hormone and uh, the, the steroid hormones which we studied which are receptors which is floating on the where it is on the cytosol because it can that steroids can pass through and then the receptors are here so it may bind with that one and then it start the reaction that's what we have studied last class. Today, the peptide hormones, their receptors are in the membrane. So that's why it is membrane insoluble, so it can bind in here, this membrane receptors. And then it activates the process of the signal transductions towards the cytosol as well as to the nucleus. So we will see the mechanism of this peptide hormone today. Okay, so that's part, part of this introduction. We'll see how these peptide hormones, in, in general, uh, the water soluble hormones include peptide hormones. We will see the examples peptide or protein hormones. Also, we it includes catecholamine. catecholamine. So, let us see how this reaction when we studied last class when I just talked here this is membrane when I started when I put a membrane I put the two lines in it you know because of the cells and cell architecture why you know about the lipid bilayer membrane anyone know about what is lipid bilayer membrane lipid bilayer membrane sorry I put it a lipid by layer membrane. This one, one layer there. Anyone? Is there any chance of uh, structure of membrane? Have you studied structure of membrane in biochemistry classes? Or if not, I just I'm going to give them an introduction for that. Suppose the, the cell, normally we say this is the cell and this is the cell membrane, but this is this membrane is made up of two layers of uh, lipids, like um, I'll just draw here. It, it made up of a, a triglyceride, triglyceride, you know, the fat, you know, lipid means fat, right, lipid. The lipid is made up of triglycerides. The triglyceride is nothing but um, a, a glycerol moiety, CH2OH and CHOH and CH2OH. This is a glycerol, okay? And this glycerol is being esterified with a long chain fatty acids. Normally, the fatty acids it will go like this, you know, CH3, CH2, 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 and then COOH, it comes out. So, I can put all the CH2 on double bond and single bond, like a CH2 to the power N, meaning it's the 18 uh, CH2 molecules, or 16, or 21, or 22, like long chain fatty acids. This is fatty acids. So, this alcohol group of glycerol and the acid group of the fatty acid, they form like an acid base like salt, right? So, here the OH and then the acid group, the hydrogen ions here, and they form an ester, you know, alcohol and the acid form ester. Do you remember that alcohol and acid form ester in organic chemistry? Or you know, or you don't know anything about it? Organic chemistry? Have you done organic chemistry? Yes? When you do sodium hydroxide, NaOH and HCl, what will happen? When you react with the chemistry, simple chemistry class, what happens when, when, when there is a reaction? Sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid, you have acid and base, that will produce what? Sodium chloride and HOH, it goes out, so it comes out water, right? Do you remember that one? 
in your early class how the sodium hydroxide and the hydrochloric acid in a chemical reaction it forms sodium chloride and water the same way when you do this one or the glycerol I'll write it here I put it like this so CH2 OH 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 and OH so these are the glycerol moiety glycerol and this is the fatty acid CH3 I put the reverse order right I put it that way so this is another fatty acid fatty acid 1 fatty acid 2 and then fatty acid 3 and they form uh, this is the acid group and then this is the uh, water moiety so they will remove three molecule of water will go out but at the same time the net result is going to be like this F1 F2 or F3 so this is called triglyceride because of three fatty acid esterified with one glycerol molecule it is called triglyceride but in the membrane, sometimes this triglyceride, in, in, in some occasions, what happens here, this triglycerol, lab, this one, uh, this is a fatty acid one, and this is fatty acid two, this moiety, the OH group, will be there. So it is not esterified. So it is called, again, is a diacylglycerol. So in the membrane, what happened? In the biological uh, membranes, in biomembranes, you know, this one I can put it like a, like this. See, it is a one triglyceride molecule, okay, and then one diglyceride molecule which is going on. This is this is the region where the hydro hydrophilic region, and this is the fatty acid part. This is hydro phobic part. That is the water hating and water loving part. Okay. In other words, it the membrane it is having is made up of like this. Okay. This is one layer. So what happened this one, this is the CH2, CH2, this other group, this love water. So water loving. In other words, this is a filling right hydrophilic hydro means water hydrophilic this hydrophilic region this part and this part this this one which is the hydrophobic part hydrophobic phobia you know have you heard of phobia that hater so here the hydrophobia means is the water hating or this is not water loving part of this this is mainly of the fatty acid long chain of fatty acids so this is one layer suppose if you identical with the another layer what will happen if a two layer of that so that form like this this is one layer top layer okay and now this is the another layer So, so if you have the membrane, I just said membrane, just a part of this membrane, it is made up of, this is cytosol, okay, cytosol, this region, and this is the outside of the cell, and this is the inside the cell where the nucleus and everything is going to be down, but this is the portion which I enlarged here, this is the lipid bilayer membrane, this is lipid, single layer, this is another layer. What will happen in this lipid bilayer membrane, see it is made up of all the end circle of, of the whole cell is, is covered by cell membrane which is made up of this lipid bilayer. And to this bilayer you get uh, normally the proteins are going to be here. Proteins will, will go from here to here and here to here, you know. So, so what in, in a matter of fact the membrane is made up of lipids, the fatty acids and the glycerol that's uh, you know as a glyceride moiety as well as you get the protein which is uh, which is also present in between these molecules so it's a, it's a lipid bilayer membrane with an enormous amount of the protein and this protein will have specific function we will see that one okay now you know about what is the structure of a biomembrane right how the biomembrane is made up of glycerol and 
fatty acids esterified that is the lipid bilayer membrane that's what the two layer this is the upper layer and this is the lower layer so two layers that's why it is called lipid bilayer membrane you follow now and this lipid bilayer membrane which is separates from the cytosol from the outside of the cell so each cell is made up of this membrane and this membrane is having uh, more uh, mostly of the protein the red color which i draw as a structure of the proteins okay so they this protein will, will have, this is a, a, an example of the protein, and this protein which is lying there, and, and some protein which is sticking outside of this membrane. And sometimes, you know, this may activate like a, like a, like a receptor like this. Could you see that one here? So it, it acts like this one as a receptor. So if there is a, uh, any hormone which is coming out from the outside, and then what it can can come and bind here. Let's suppose this is the hormone. And immediately, if this hormone, then it will attract, then it will bind together. When it binds, this structure will change. Initially, it was here like this, without the hormone. But with the hormone, it will go and fold like this. It changes the structure. So this is a, one of these receptors. And these receptors are the famous, are the popular for the protein binding or protein hormone binding receptors are there. So that's what I want to make sure you understand how this uh, lipid bilayer membrane which is being activating. Okay. Now we'll see what what all the other things we will study here. I'll, I'll, I'll write it is outside outside the cells. Okay. Now this is the lipid bilayer membrane. Whenever I draw two lines means that is a lipid bilayer. And this is a receptors, and these receptors where you will, you get the protein hormone, which is here, and it is going to be bind here, right? And this is inside the cell, inside cell. So it, the receptors which is present at the membrane level, because this protein hormone cannot go through directly into the cytosol because they are membrane insoluble, so they have. They are receptors. This is receptors. And the receptor binds with the prepared hormone. And then it changes its shapes. And then it gives a signaling molecule to the nucleus. Okay. So when it bounds from here's one form of this enzyme. And then when it changes into the other form across the membrane. Form 1 to form 2. When it changes, it changes the, the protein. It changes the another form. And thereby it activates. Let us see how this is being activated, this process. That's what I want to discuss today, okay? Now you should know where we are, okay? The process of this protein binding, or protein hormone binding to the membrane, that activates a special class of molecule called G proteins. You will see that, what is G proteins? And especially G protein coupled receptors coupled receptors because the, the protein which I mentioned before, these G proteins are mainly a G protein coupled receptors. It has a function now. And this G protein coupled receptors, they are the one which are binding with the protein hormones and they are in a trans membrane protein. As I mentioned before, they are present in the membrane in a form as a transmembrane protein. How this transmembrane protein looks like, that's very important to, to see the structure, the arrangement of that, of that protein, okay? Suppose this is the, your lipid bilayer, okay? And this protein, which I mentioned before, because it's made up of all these lipid bilayers, you know, which I mentioned before, which is having the, you know, all, uh, you know, all the fatty acids and, and the hydrophobic region, and these are the hydrophilic regions and everything, okay. But this protein will go like this as a sevenfold. One, two, three, four, five, six, and seven, like one fold. Two, three, four, five, six, and go on seven. So it goes like this. See the polypeptide chain. You know about the protein structure, 
it is the amino acids and amino acids and amino acids amino acids but they can they 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 are not like a straight line but they can fold that's why i just uh, give this an example this is like a protein it can fold like this or it can fold like this so it can fold in any form you know but this is a particular fold which you get in between these two membrane you get this trans membrane they are called trans membrane and they also have seven fold that's very important to know seven fold membrane and this is in in a, in a nutshell i draw like this meaning this protein i ra uh, rather not like individualized fold but i can draw like this it has a binding site binding site binding site for what peptide hormone so this is the outside the hormone is floating from the blood capillaries and from that it comes and binds here so the hormones cannot activate all the cells that's very important it can bind whenever there is wherever there is a receptors or the cell membrane that has these receptor protein which is the membrane then only it can bind otherwise it won't bind it won't activate so when it binds to these receptors okay this protein structure will change okay now what accompany this one you see this is not a only one protein which is present in the membrane these are the g coupled uh, protein why we call it as a g coupled uh, receptors or the protein because it also accompany with uh, another three subunits of alpha beta and gamma okay alpha beta and gamma subunits you follow that yes i mentioned before the lipid bilayer membrane and also i mentioned before the proteins which is going up and down like a folded proteins are there and then i discussed about this protein which is also accompanying with their beta subunit gamma subunit alpha subunit and they have a binding site for the peptide hormone it is clear i mean my point here today how the protein hormones or peptide hormone activate a particular cell how they initiate the reaction the hormone action what 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 happens to the hormone which is present in the blood so next thing is it should go and attack it go and target cells what happened the target cell the target cell they have the lipid bilayer membrane in the individual cells they have the protein and which a protein which you call it as g coupled receptors are the protein and and that protein will have seven fold and also they have a, a beta subunit gamma subunit alpha subunit now what happened to this this alpha subunits okay draw like this okay this is a membrane and this is a protein okay so this alpha subunit alpha beta gamma as soon as this receptors binds with the protein they binds with the here this one this this alpha subunit already has been attached with the gdp you know gdp this alpha subunit already attached with the gdp you know the uh, in a dna structure you know a a g c t like that that's the g that's a guanine right guanidinate guanidinate diphosphate guanidinate diphosphate we call it gdp this is attached already attached with the alpha subunit so whenever this gdp alpha attachment and beta and gamma and the large receptors which is present in the membrane this is the trans membrane where these subunits are present this is outside the cell and this is inside the cell inside the cell where it is in the cytoplasm so when the hormone which will attach to this then the i mentioned before the structure of this protein will change when it changes in such a way it separates out the beta and gamma separates out and the alpha it separates out how i'll draw the other one okay now this is the one where the receptors and the hormone is binding to it 
and the beta subunit and gamma subunit separates out and alpha here that is being attached to it. When it is attached to it, this the, the process, the first part when when this receptors which attach to the hormone and this alpha subunit and the GDP which is attached to it and it is going to react with the GTP. They guanidate triphosphate. When the GTP comes, when it hormone binds and the GTP will come here and then attach to this, so it will remove this GDP into GTP. When whenever there's a, a phosphate molecule is added to the alpha subunit, it is being aggravated, it is being activated. So it will give the energy to push this way and, and this will fold and this will push this other side. So what will happen in a, in a next uh, uh, round, you get this alpha subunit attached to GTP and it gives more energy and to separate this from the main receptors. So alpha GTP. So the, the, the G protein name is given because of the guanidylate binding protein to the alpha. So that's what you should remember there. Because there's a lot of things going on in the G protein and the latest uh, work which is on the G protein, couple receptors and drugs and everything, they, they put new medications and, and all the drugs, the activation, everything's depend upon the G protein coupled receptors. That's what I need to give you an, uh, a detailed um, mechanism now. Okay. Now the GTP is attached to the alpha, okay? And this protein, we call it as a G protein. This entire receptors, protein, and coupled hormone. So everything is G protein coupled receptors, we call it. So this is the G protein. So you may get an, a, a question in your uh, competitive exam or any other exam. What is GTP or what is GMP? Well, I mean, what is a G protein coupled receptors? It is invariably, it is a must question in any exam or competitive exam when you go for the MCAT, DCAT or, uh, or pharmacy school, anywhere, or even for interview, they used to ask this question. So this is the right time you should learn clearly. Okay, G protein coupled receptors. Okay, this GTP will do many, many things. No, many, many things. We will study about it. So what happens now, the hormone is floating on the outside. It binds with a protein, that's a G protein coupled receptors, as soon as GTP binds and the beta and gamma subunit separates out and you get a, an alpha subunit with a GTP molecule and, and this is the one which is a more action potential, more, more of, a, of, a, of acting in the next level on the hormone uh, energy, uh, I mean the signal transduction pathway, okay. So do you form a do, 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 you, do you get up to this point before I just go into the move on to the next level? Do you understand that? Sorry? Yes, G protein, yes. G protein is the one as a receptor, it's a hormone receptor. Which hormone? Steroid hormone or peptide hormone? Peptide hormone, because steroid hormones, they can solubilize the membrane and getting into the cytosol. Because peptide hormone, it is not soluble in the membrane and it is a water soluble hormone and it is not soluble in the biomembrane or biological membrane. It needs to be bind with the receptor which is present on the membrane receptors. So the membranes, they have the receptors and that receptor's name we call it as a G protein. And why we call it G protein coupled receptors? Because this protein is being uh, combined with the subunits like a, a alpha, beta, and gamma subunits, one of the alpha subunits is attached to the guanidylate diphosphate. As a guanidylate diphosphate molecule is attached to it. That's why we call it as a G protein. Yes? Follow? Why we call it as G protein? Because guanidylate, that's a, that's a molecule attached to the protein. That's why we call it G protein. G for Guani delayed. That's you should remember. Okay. So now we will see about the mechanism which is going over the next level. Any questions from Cinco Ranch? Uh, do you follow? Yes. Okay.
Now the G protein, okay, I just go here. So this is the initial space where the alpha, beta, gamma is there and then the hormone binds. What will happen now? The hormone binding and then you have a beta and gamma separates out and then alpha is there. And then this is the getting GTP, alpha GTP. Okay. And, and, and this will do many things. What things they will do? The next level, I mean, um, the, I'm, I'm writing another membrane, okay? This, name, this GTP is next to, because I don't have space here, I'm, I'm just writing it here, right? So the, the, there is a, there's a adenylate cyclase, there's an enzyme called the AC, okay? This, this enzyme, call it adenylate, adenylate cyclase enzyme. So the GTP in the further, you know, this is the alpha GTP, okay, GTP, it will, it will activate this enzyme, which is also a membrane bound enzyme adenylate cyclase. What this adenylate cyclase will do, you know the ATP molecule, ATP converted to cyclic AMP. You know, in, in the ATP molecule is made up of um, yeah, yeah, adenine nucleotide and then it's attached to a yeah, sugar, ribose sugar, and then it, it has a yeah, phosphate molecule, three phosphate group. That's why it's called triphosphate. Adenosine triphosphate what will happen this adenylate cyclase that we call it at the AC and it will cleave these two phosphate group out and then make a cyclic reaction to cyclic bond to the adenine molecule, the adenosine molecule. So in that by we call it a cyclic AMP because the adenosine monophosphate because this bond is cyclic so we call it cyclic AMP. Now, we are discussing about what is the role of this alpha GTP. The alpha GTP, because it is present in the membrane, mind it, it is present in the membrane, and the next to the membrane of GTP, you find the AC, that adenylate cyclase. So, it won't keep quiet. As soon as it has been activated, it will go and hinder. It will go and activate the neighbor. So, that's what it happens. The neighbor is adenylate cyclase, and the adenylate cyclase is going, going to be act on ATP molecule into cyclic AMP. So that's what the, I'm just giving this explanation how this ATP molecule structure initially, then after this adenylate cyclase activation, it removes the two phosphate molecule and then give the cyclic AMP formation. You follow? Yes? It's for physiological reactions, we need the ATP. ATP is a current energy currency, right? So the, once the ATP is being converted into cyclic AMP, then the cyclic AMP will do many things. So that's what the, we want to study about now. Okay. Now, the cyclic AMP, where the cyclic AMP is coming from, from the ATP to adenylate cyclase, how the, that adenylate cyclase is activated by G protein, how the G protein or the G uh, alpha subunit, how the alpha subunit with the G protein which is coming from, from G protein couple receptors, now how that's activated because of the hormone binding. Yes, could you trace out now? I'm just I'm following through the pathway now. Now cyclic AMP is there in the cytoplasm, okay? And if you have a, a lipid bilayer membrane already, and it has its own yeah, ion channels, you know, potassium ion, calcium ion, and sodium ion channels, have you studied before, we have studied about? So this ion channels, so it will direct act on the ion channel, ion channel, this is direct, okay, it will activate the ion channel and, and the another pathway it can also activate a protein kinase, PK, we call it as a protein kinase, K-I-N-A-S-E, protein kinase enzyme. So it activates, cyclic AMP will in the cytoplasm activate protein kinase. And this protein kinase will not do, you know, keep quiet, but it, it, would, it will activate the directly on the transcription factors. Transcription factors. One of the transcription factors, what is transcription in, in, the, in the DNA? Um, this transcription factor will bind to the DNA and it will transcribe a particular gene. The transcription factors are the proteins again 
and they are floating in the cytoplasm. As soon as the protein kinase will add a phosphate, always the kinase means it add phosphate group to the protein. So protein kinase take the add the phosphate group to the transcription factors. When the transcription factors will pick up this phosphate group, then it will be activated. It will it will across go across the nuclear membrane nuclear membrane and the nucleus you get DNA, DNA molecule. The DNA there are several chromosomes you know 23 pairs of chromosomes and, 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 and there are several genes but it will go this transcription factor is a particular gene then it will go and bind to a gene. What is the name of the transcription factor? This is also a protein we call it as a C R E B CRUB. Otherwise, I will I will explain what is C R E B. That is a protein. This is the transcription factors. The name of the transcription factor is CRUB. What is CRUB? Cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP response. Cyclic AMP response element E L E M E N T cyclic AMP response element binding protein binding protein B C R E B C for cyclic AMP R is response and then E for element and B for binding protein so that's why we call it a CRUB it's a long name so we abbreviated to C R E B. So this transcription factor, and otherwise we call it as a CRUB, which is being response of the cyclic AMP. The cyclic AMP through protein kinase activate the transcription factor or the CRUB. That's why we call it cyclic AMP response element binding protein. And this transcription factor will bind to the DNA and it starts transcription. It helps the transcription. It helps to bind with the promoter of a particular gene and the transcription will occur. Now, do you follow now from the hormone? It activate the G coupled receptors and G coupled receptors is going to be activated to cyclic AMP. Cyclic AMP now getting the protein kinase and protein kinase activate transcription factors. Transcription factors now migrate into the nuclear membrane, into the nucleus, into the DNA and to the gene and it binds a specific site on the DNA and transcribe a particular gene. So that is the purpose of the hormone. Okay. So now the process and the physiological process this is a one pathway and this is a, a slow process. And this is the fast one. Fast means as soon as the cyclic AMP it opened the channel in the milliseconds. Okay. Seconds or milliseconds. And it will take the slow process of the DNA in, you know the activation of the, there are so many steps involved and, and, and that will take probably in hours, probably sometime it is on days, you know, days or some hours. So the protein kinase is activated. The another pathway which will which will uh, which will activate as a as a indirect pathway. These are indirect. This is direct to the ion channel, indirect for the transcription factors to the DNA. Another pathway in the cyclic AMP will activate. This is also inactive. So, sorry, sorry, indirect. This is indirect pathway. It will activate cytosolic targets. Are the phosphorylation, cytosol phosphorylation, phosphorylation of many proteins. Okay, so th just one other thing is protein kinase. See here, and this is a very very slow process, which is the transcription process. But the phosphorylation, which is occurring here, this is a, an intermediate level of the the phosphorylation. So if you put together all in a, in, a, in a nutshell, if you want to, uh, you know, get a, get a get a feel about what happened when a protein hormone or a peptide hormone uh, getting into the cell, what happens inside the cell? So that's our question. So when you when you summarize the the whatever we learn now, 
the G protein couple receptors that is uh, being activated by the binding of the hormone because of the GTP, this subunit is separated out. When they separate out, you get the alpha subunit with the GTP is attached. And this alpha GTP will now atta uh, attack on the adenylate cyclase enzyme or it activate the adenylate cyclase enzyme which will in turn convert ATP into cyclic AMP, okay? This is the mechanism how the ATP is converted into cyclic AMP. Once the cyclic AMP is there and it does three processes. One is the direct action and the ion channel and thereby it can either efflex or inflex the ionic movement in the ion channel and the another process which is going to protein kinase is activate and then this process again is an in indirect process and this is a direct one. This will activate, uh, uh, this protein kinase will activate the transcription factors. The name of this transcription factors protein we call it scrub that is cyclic AMP response elements binding protein and this protein now getting into the DNA and it transcribes a particular gene. Do you follow? Up to this? Just summarize. I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Um, how does the cyclic AMP know what it needs to do? Does it depend on the, the type of signal or how does it distinguish that sound? Okay. See, the cyclic AMP, as soon as it gives, it, it, it get in, in uh, it's been converted into the ATP, the cyclic AMP because of annulate cyclase, the concentration of cyclic AMP, okay? So it will go directly whenever there is a channel. It, if it is a nearby to the adenylate cyclase, meaning the cyclic AMP necessary for this channel, number one, okay? The cyclic AMP level, it is going to be maintained by phosphodiesterase. This phosphodiesterase, what will happen? That will... Uh, it gives the cyclic AMP in a field, direct field on that. So it regulates the availability of cyclic AMP to the protein kinase. So the level of, suppose the hormone which is binding and you get the hormone binding and, and you get the, the ATP is less number of ATP, the amount of ATP is available, then you will get the less amount of cyclic AMP and this reaction is going to be less. If you have more of this ATP, then you have more of cyclic AMP. Because ATP records for the other cellular process. You cannot expect all the ATP has been used for this uh, cyclic AMP production. Okay. So depending upon the availability of the, uh, in other words, the energetic status of that particular cell. Suppose the cell is not getting respiration, it is not getting oxygen, it is uh, something is inhibited, some diseased condition, what happened? This process is going to be slows down because the cell is not being produced more of ATP. <laughs> so you get cyclic AMP level goes down and that will not activate the channel. But in case, if you have more of cyclic AMP in this, so a part which will go in here and another part. So it, the, once the channel is being opened and it is closed and this business is over for cyclic AMP, then the cyclic AMP is being activated towards the protein kinase and thereby the transcription factors and, and the gene expression will go on. Suppose if all this process is not uh, being available, everything is closed down, the cyclic AMP is channeled through this pathway and activating the gene transcription process, okay? The phosphodiesterase one, and that is the one which is going to be regulated, that inhibits the formation of the cyclic AMP, okay? Ion channel is a calcium or potassium or, uh, you know, sodium against the concentration gradient. You have to, uh, you know, you, you have to make sure the calcium is, is transported into the cell. Sometimes, you know, it's going outside the cell. The channel will do in both, both directions, whether it open, that depending upon the particular cell, which are, whether it gets in or get out of the cell. So I generally, I give uh, notation as a channel, just opening of the door, whether going in or out, doesn't matter. Uh, depending upon the cell, it will get in certain ion, it will go certain in going out. Okay? Okay. G, am I answering the question? From Cinco Ranch? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. All right. You're welcome. Um, now, the... Uh, uh, Dr. Soma. Yes. 
uh, is there enough to clear TMP? Do yes. all three processes take yes. place? Yes, 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 okay. yes, yes, that's right. But the question is the, the fate of cyclic AMP, that's determined. So one example I can give you, if more of cyclic AMP available, then you get of the protein kinase and signaling and, and the ion channel is opening and everything. And this ion channel mainly, you know, in olfactory cell, a particular type of cell. It is not necessary uh, that it will activate the gene expression. That particular cell, more of the ion channel. So cyclic AMP is directed towards the opening of those channels rather than going on to the gene transcription process. In some cell, there is no channel at all, but the cyclic AMP is directed to that particular uh, gene expression level. So depending upon the cells, where it, the hormone binds and activate. Do you follow that? Yes? Some cell, you may get more of, of, of the uh, ion channel. In some cell, maybe one or two, and the rest of the thing has been concentrated. So depending upon cyclic AMP level, availability, and their direction. One more thing. If you inhibit the phosphodiesterase enzyme, what will happen? Because normally phosphodiesterase membrane, uh, sorry, phosphodiesterase uh, molecule inhibit uh, uh, the cyclic AMP, uh, uh, cyclic AMP production. The level of cyclic AMP uh, is going to be reduced because of this phosphodiesterase and when we degrade the cyclic AMP level. So if you don't want cyclic AMP is more, what will happen? You get this one, right? So phosphodiesterase, that, that enzyme will regulate the availability of cyclic AMP. So when you inhibit this molecule, you will get more. In other words, I'll write like that. Phosphodiesterase. Okay. This molecule, okay, will inhibit cyclic AMP. Okay. It inhibit. So as you said, if more hormone is threshing in, okay, and that you more of cyclic AMP, but you need to regulate, hey, I don't want more of this gene, or, or more of the ion channels open, come on, shut down the cyclic AMP, because cyclic AMP is a nuisance, I don't want it. Then this enzyme, some phosphodiesterase enzyme has been activated, and thereby, you know, it inhibits this cyclic AMP process. That regulates cyclic AMP process. Okay. Suppose if you if you want a cyclic AMP more, you have to you have to shut off this phosphodiesterase. That's what the caffeine doing. Whenever you take coffee, you get more of of a good good thing. You feel good about coffee. That's of inhibit the phosphodiesterase enzyme which is present there, and and thereby what will happen if you inhibit this, you get more of cyclic AMP level, and that will give you yeah, good energy value on that one, okay? That's one of the things. So do you, do you follow uh, the, the role of cyclic AMP now? Cyclic AMP degraded by phosphodiesterase. That's a temporal factor. Now, the next one, which we need to go on IP3. See, we are talking about the peptide hormone action. So this is alpha. Uh, I mean, uh, alpha, beta, and gamma, and this is a protein, and the receptor is binding. Now, you get, uh, this is being separated out, and you get the alpha subunit of GTP. So, the same thing I am writing, beta and gamma is separated out after the binding of the hormone. So the hormone is binding, the hormone receptor. And this GTP, again, alpha GTP, or G protein, coupled receptor of the subunit, it is going to activate another pathway, we call it IP3 and calcium pathway. This is very important, okay? IP3 and calcium. Um, in the membrane, in the biological membrane, which I mentioned before, another enzyme, just like adenylate cyclase, we have another membrane, we call a uh, membrane binding enzyme, we call PLC. That is, we call it as a phospholipase C phospholipase C, phospholipase C. And this enzyme, the phospholipase will act on the phospholipids. On the phospholipids, where the phospholipids are? The phospholipids are this membrane here. They are, because I, I mentioned before, 
the lipid bilayer membrane or the lipids are there, right? So these are these target which is present in the membrane itself. So the, mem the enzyme also present in the membrane and it can also, the substrate also into the membrane. But normally it is full, keep quiet, but when it's being activated, then it will take, uh, you know, uh, the substrate of its own membrane and then it cleaves the product. Let us see what those products are now, okay? It's the membrane, okay, right? And the PLC are the enzyme just there, phospholipase C enzyme. And you have the triglyceride just going on the, this membrane level, okay. They are called um, triglycerides and these triglycerides it will activate that it will cleave into two part okay it will act and it will give a diglyceride path two of them and the another one which is going to be at the bottom one here inositol here which is going to separate it out and this is we call it ip3 and they the substrate which is the phospholipid and this phospholipid we call it as the phospho Phosphatidyl, phosphatidyl, T U I D Y L, phosphatidyl, inositol, I N O S I T O L, phosphatidyl ionositol. These molecules are present in the membrane, you know, lipid bilayer membrane, this membrane. This membrane is made up of the phosphatidyl ionositol. So, this enzyme, phospholipase, once it is being activated, phospholipase C, which is being activated by how? GTP, alpha GTP. The alpha GTP act on the phospholipase C enzyme and this enzyme will neighboring phosphatidyl inositol, which is present in the membrane and then it gives a diacylglycerol. There are two molecules of fatty acid attached to it, diacylglycerol and also another molecule we call it as IP3. This is called enocytol triphosphate. IT, IP3. Otherwise, we call it enocytol triphosphate. Tri means here 3 and P for phosphate, I for enocytol. So, enocytol triphosphate is being released. You follow up to this point? Just like the last slide which we discussed about the how the GTP, alpha GTP subunit activates cyclic AMP, adenylate cyclate. I am explaining now in a different scenario where another reaction, another function of this GTP attached to the alpha subunit activate the phospholipase C enzyme and this enzyme will activate phosphatidyl inositol which is present in the membrane and it will produce a product like diacylglycerol which is also, you know, pushing again in the membrane, but it releases a IP3 molecule in the cytosol. Otherwise, inositol triphosphate is released in cytosol. What this will do in the cytoplasm? Inositol triphosphate. That's what we are going to see now. So, but this is the membrane and you get more of these vesicles which is present. And these vesicles are the storehouse of calcium. And this calcium in the cytoplasm, the cytoplasm, okay, the calciums are very minimum here. I mean, it is there, but this is going to be transported across because against the concentration gradient, this calcium is going through like a like an ATP process, like an active transport. So you need ATP to ADP. So, once you get the calcium is against the concentration gradient, normally what will happen, higher concentration to the lower concentration, that is a, you know, on, against any concentration or a diffusion process. When you go against the lower, against the higher, lower to higher concentration and against the concentration gradient, you need ATP, that's the active transport. So, in the vesicles, they are the vesicles. These vesicles are storehouse of calcium. Calcium storehouse, calcium store, calcium storing vesicles. When this calcium is already, if there is no need for calcium in its function, this ultimately 
transfer into a vesicle, a small vesicle. There are a lot of vesicles there which will store calcium inside the, cyto inside, inside the vesicle, in the cytoplasm. Whenever it releases, there is a need for the release of this calcium. How this will release? When the IP3, when the last class which I mentioned before, I mean last uh, slide which I mentioned uh, from the uh, action of the GTP protein and phospholipase C and the phosphatidylenoacetal and that releases the IP3 and this IP3 will, will come and uh, attach to another channel, that's the calcium channel. It comes here, IP3. It binds here and thereby it you an efflux of calcium. The calcium is coming out. Calcium is coming out. Follow now? In general, in the cell, the calcium is stored in the vesicle. We call it calcium stored vesicle. And this how the calcium is stored? By an active transport process because against the concentration gradient. So you need to have the calcium unnecessary wandering calcium inside the cell is stored in a calcium vesicle. Whenever this uh, GTP are the binding with the hormones and peptide hormones and activating these uh, receptors, G coupled protein receptors and G proteins activated and this is being activated phospholipase C and then phosphatidylinositol is activated, IP3 is produced in cytosol and IP3 now binds with calcium channel of the vesicle, make sure the calcium is coming out. So it is efflux we call it. Yeah, flex of calcium. And calcium now coming into the cytoplasm. So you may wonder, hey, it's coming out and this is going in. What is the what is what is the purpose of this calcium now? So this calcium now is going to be used for the other reaction like a protein kinase C pathway, and that is the indirect pathway. I'll write it in a way. This calcium. Now I'm talking about the calcium. The calcium is coming from the vesicles, right? It will activate. I put calcium 2 plus because the calcium is having a two valency of plus plus. So I put the two positive ions, so I put calcium ion 2 plus ions here. Okay. So the PKC, that is on the um, protein kinase C molecule. Protein kinase C. Okay. C for calcium. Protein kinase C. And this is the calcium dependent. This calcium will bind here, it will activate, and it is the phosphorylation cascade. Phosphorylation cascade. Meaning, this calcium, the more of the phosphate group, and uh, another protein is phos phosphorylation added, another protein. So it goes on and on. Also, it activates the calcium, will activate at binding to your protein. Calcium binding protein. One example for calcium binding protein is calmodulin, C-A-L-M-O-D-U, modulin, okay, this is U, okay, calmodulin is a calcium binding protein, cal, calcium, modulin is a protein, okay, calmodulin is a calcium binding protein, this calcium which is coming in cytoplasm, which will be used for this as well as this, and thereby, in a previous slide which I showed you, the calcium is coming out, more calcium, Calcium and this calcium is the protein kinase C as well as calmodulin and thereby the calcium is used up. More of the calcium which is coming out of the vesicle is used up and thereby, you know, this calcium again, it needs to be pushed in whenever the low concentration, then it will move in and then it will store there. Dr. Okay. Sama, yes. What does calcium do to the binding protein? It, the, it will bind to the protein, we call it as a calmodulin and the calmodulin will do it as different functions in a physiological reaction. We need for certain other reaction calcium where the calcium which is calmodulin is the one which will supply the calcium for the other people. It's just like a transporting protein of calcium. Just like a truck load of calcium. And the calcium is loaded here. This is a, a loading dock in the, from the vesicle. And this hormone will help to synthesize more of calmodulin, okay? Now, the next part is the two major intracellular regulators which we have seen now, okay? Two major intracellular, because whatever we have studied now, which is inside the cell, that is called intracellular. Within the cell, what are the reaction? We call it intra, intracellular, intracellular 
regulators. So what is intracellular regulators? The reaction or biochemical reaction or biochemical interaction, there are several pathways which is being activated by this intracellular regulator. What are these two intracellular regulators? One is what we have seen, phosphate group, okay. Another molecule we have studied is calcium molecule. So calcium and phosphate that made uh, intracellular regulators. What this phosphate will do? It will either activate the kinases, it will add more of phosphate group or it, the other enzyme which are the phosphate as a removal of phosphate by an enzyme called phosphatase. Phosphatase. Phosphatase, I normally I call it as a scissor because it cut the, it will cut the phosphate group from the molecule. So phosphatase like this. Kinases which will add phosphate. So otherwise we call it as a phosphate group add and this is a minus, we call it like that. The another one is the calcium which we have seen by constant removal, constant removal from the cells by using a calcium pump, calcium pump, okay. And also we studied in the cytoplasmic storage, this one, cyto calcium pumps that we have studied in the cytoplasmic storage, where the calcium is stored. And the cal concentration of the calcium normally present in the cell is 10 to the power of minus 6 molar, that is the concentration. And the calcium and phosphate also changes the protein conformation. Whenever the calcium or the phosphate group and both involved, both molecule involved in the protein conformation, conformation, you know, the structure of the protein. Protein conformation and this protein conformation that will change the activity. Activity means it either it inhibits, uh, it activates, that's not the positive sign, or it may inhibit the positive or negative. I put plus plus and minus minus. That means it may inhibit a act, certain activity of this protein or the enzyme. So protein conformation, which I mentioned before, whenever the calcium is binding to it, and then it will change its structure. So initially it was like this, and when the calcium is binding to this, and what will happen is structure will be changed. And thereby, this structure may activate a certain type of protein or inhibit a certain type of protein. So, uh, the calcium, sorry, go ahead. Uh, is calcium like a coenzyme? Uh, yes, you can call it as a coenzyme, but calcium is a, another, I can uh, call it as a cofactor in, in that case, okay? okay. Now, along in the same line, um, some of these uh, calcium, this calcium involved, I, I'm just talking about this calcium now, okay? Calcium activate nitric oxide, okay? Nitric oxide. And this is being discovered in 1990, the role of calcium. And this the enzyme, nitric oxide is being produced inside the cell by an enzyme called nitric oxide synthetase. This enzyme, otherwise we call it NOS, NOS, NOS. And this enzyme, NOS, will convert arginine, L arginine amino acid, arginine to L citrulline, C I T R U, citrulline, and it releases a molecule of nitric oxide, this NO. And this NO, it just like a like a laughing gas, nitrous oxide, right? This nitric oxide will do many things and the nitric oxide diffuse through the cell, can diffuse easily through cell, through cells, okay? And this can diffuse and at the same time, it can also target guanidylate cyclase enzyme, okay? I'll put it that, like another one, NO, can act as a target cell. Target is guanidylate, guanidylate, D, guanidylate cyclase. Guanidylate cyclase enzyme, which will convert the GTP, like adenylate cyclase, 
it will convert the GTP into cyclic GMP, C for cyclic and GMP, small c and capital G, capital M, capital P, cyclic GMP, okay. And this cyclic GMP, this conversion, okay, after diffusing through the cells, it target this cyclic, uh, I mean, GTP to cyclic GMP, and it forms in the neural activity, this cyclic GMP, in the neural activity, it mainly neural, the neurons, neural activity, they activate the neuron, okay. And also, this diffusion of this um, neural activity, I just put the one neuron and this is another neuron, okay, and cyclic GMP will, will activate the release of the neurotransmitters and this again in turn in the blood capillaries, okay, it activates on the blood capillaries, induces NO, that's nitric oxide on blood capillaries that induces vasodilation, dilation. This vasodilation that gives a, a, a boost for the most of the blocked artery or the capillaries. In, in other words, in, um, in, a, in a way that Viagra, which acts on this one, that's one of these mechanisms. It induces the vasodilation. So that's why this is a mechanism of through nitric oxide synthesis and activity. So, so we have studied in all, um, so far, um, the last class we studied about the steroid hormones and now this time we are studying about peptide hormone and its action, peptide hormone. And, and, and then here what we, we, we have studied on the peptide hormone on the synthesis on the vesicles and, and also the mechanism and synthesis and then the molecular properties, molecular properties. You have studied up to these prepared hormones, okay? Do you have any question now? Because I stop here and then I'll give a break and then we will start the next part of the hormones now. Any question? Cinco Ranch? I'll go from this beginning. Glycogen has been converted to glucose 6, 1, sorry, glucose 6-phosphate, and glucose 6-phosphate is eliminated as a glucose. And it can also be reversal reaction, glucose 6-phosphate to glycogen synthase to back to synthesis of glycogen. And this process of glycogen to glucose 6-phosphate is facilitated by phosphorylated form of phosphorylase A enzyme. And when this enzyme is removed by a phosphate group, then it become an inactive form of phosphorylase B. How this is being happened? Because this is being facilitated by phosphoprotein, phosphoprotein phosphatase. Um, I'll, 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 I'll write it here in a, in a different way. Phosphoprotein phosphatase. As I mentioned before, phosphatase, what they will do? Phosphatase reaction, it gives you a, a, like, a, like a scissor, right? So it will eliminate this phosphate group and thereby the phosphate is eliminated and you get a phosphorylase B form. And this is a, mostly an inactive form. And now, this phosphorylase B is being phosphorylated back on here. This is the active form where you need more of ATP and it's been ADP which is coming up. So, glycogen has been activated by phosphorylase A to form glucose 6-phosphate and thereby it releases glucose. But once it's been done, the phosphorylase A is being inactivated by the phosphoprotein phosphatase enzyme, which will remove the phosphate group and become a phosphorylase B form, and this is more mostly on inactive form. After the, you follow this path? Phosphorylase A is inactivated by phosphoprotein phosphatase. Phosphoprotein phosphatase. And this is an enzyme which will always remove the phosphate group, this group. You know, this is the active form, they remove the phosphate group. So you get without phosphate, the phosphorylase B is without phosphate group. 
So now it is an inactive form. But again, if you want to activate the phosphorylase A, you need ATP and to add the phosphate group phosphorylase A form. So this process as a, as a cyclic process, okay. So this phosphate group, okay, the addition of phosphate to phosphorylase A, which is being facilitated by phospho, phosphorylase kinase, okay. I'm writing this one here in a separate sheets of paper. Are they glycogen, glucose? Okay, and you this this process is being facilitated by what? Phosphorylase A. Okay, and this is going on the phosphorylase B, and this is being the ATP reaction, and the ATP coming ATP. So you get add phosphate, and then here. A removal of phosphate group. Okay? So this phosphorylase B is being activated to phosphorylase A by add addition of phosphate group by an ATP reaction. This is facilitated by phosphorylase kinase kinase reaction. Phosphorylase kinase another another one. Okay, phosphorylase kinase A. Phosphorylase kinase A. And this enzyme is being activated by from phospho phosphorylase kinase B. This enzyme is coming from phosphorylase B. This is an inactive form, and this is A for an active form, okay, where it is being activated by another molecule of ATP and to ADP. This is facilitated by protein kinase A. This protein kinase A is being activated by cyclic AMP. And cyclic AMP is being produced by the G protein or you know the alpha subunit of GDP or this adenylate cyclase activation AC. So cyclic AMP which we have studied before and this cyclic AMP is activate the protein kinase A and the protein kinase A is involved in phosphorylase B to in presence of ATP phosphorylase kinase A and this phosphorylase kinase A is activating phosphorylase B into phosphorylase A addition of a phosphate group here and thereby it facilitates this reaction of the glycogen to glucose molecule or glucose 6 phosphate and glucose 6 phosphate is eliminated as a glucose. Now, this active form again by a dephosphorylation reaction, elimination of phosphate group, okay. This is the protein kinase and here the another one is the protein kinase phosphatase reaction which will remove the phosphate group and thereby it is become an inactive form. So, the glucagon which will activate the cyclic AMP, cyclic AMP activate protein kinase and protein kinase activate phosphorylase B form to phosphorylase A, phosphorylase kinase A form and this is going to convert phosphorylase B into phosphorylase A and then this is going to activate glycogen into glucose. So this is the cascade of the reaction. Do you follow now? It is some something like, um, have you done a card game? You keep it uh, 10 different cards in a row and, uh, you know, when you touch one card and then the next card, next card will go and fall, fall, fall down. Yeah. It's a simple game. But here in the molecular game, you get glucagon when that is the one which is knocked down, you know, when just is activated and then it passes the ball just like in a football game, you know, passing the ball to the other guy. When the, the ball is there, the, the, the guy in the football game, as soon as he got the ball, he won't keep quiet. What he'll do? He'll run. Because he has to do a touchdown, right? He has run and tackle down and go again. The same thing which is happening here, the ATP molecules and the ADP and phosphorylase and phosphatase, which is doing a game where it won't allow here, but when it is successful, yes, it will come and go and activate the another one. So the energy that's on the phosphate is a ball like thing. The phosphate is like a ball. Whenever the phosphate is moving through the kinase enzyme or reaction, it will activate to it. What is the opponent guy? 
phosphatase, that guy will go and grab that ball from that enzyme and that by inactivate, that guy is going to be helpless, he cannot run. So phosphatase is the one which is removing the ball, not getting into the territory. So that is the game which is going on. So this is being uh, activated by phosphoprotein phosphatase, right? And this phosphoprotein phosphatase, which is just I mentioned before, and this is being inhibited by PPI, phosphoprotein phosphatase inhibitor, inhibitor. Okay, and this inhibitor will also having the two forms, A and B form. Okay, so I'll write it here. So yeah, phosphoprotein phosphatase phosphatase okay this is a form is an a uh, one okay phosphoprotein phosphatase inhibitor inhibitor one okay and this is an active form this is an active form what this with this enzyme will do this enzyme will do a removal of this phosphorylase A, the phosphate which is remove this one and thereby the phosphoprotein inhibitor. So, so this protein or the enzyme phosphoprotein phosphatase inhibitor which will uh, inhibit this enzyme phosphoprotein phosphatase. This enzyme this enzyme phosphoprotein phosphatase will remove the phosphorylase A into this is a phosphorylase B enzyme. So it removes this phosphate group. So whenever the, it removes, then what will happen? This is being more mostly the glycogen is not being broken down to glucose. So this this process is very significant of the removal of the phosphate group, the phosphoprotein phosphatase. And, and this is being regulated by phosphoprotein phosphatase inhibitor, which is active. And this is going from the phosphoprotein PPI2, that is inactive form. Okay. And it involves ATP molecule to ADP. Okay. And this is also being activated by, this is being activated by what? The one which we studied before about the protein kinase. Okay. Protein kinase A. So this enzyme, protein kinase A, where this enzyme is being activated? By cyclic AMP again, cyclic AMP. So I mentioned before in this, in this uh, uh, slide, cyclic AMP activated protein kinase A, and this will, in turn, inhibit this process in a way. You can see that one. It will activate this process of protein, um, phosphoprotein phosphatase inhibitor 2 to it activate this process to phosphoprotein uh, uh, phosphatase inhibitor 1, which will inhibit this process and thereby what? The phosphorylation, the removal of phosphate is now inhibited. When it inhibits, what will what will happen? When you inhibit this process, this removal of phosphate, the, you get sustaining. You have more enzyme of phosphorylase A, so glycogen is always converted to glucose. Always converted to glucose when when there is a glucagon is there. You follow now? When there is a glucagon, our aim is to synthesize glucose from glycogen. But at the same time, you have an opponent, another hormone, which is the insulin, is also sitting over there. But depending upon the situation, depending upon uh, if you have more food, which is there, uh, for that you need activation of insulin is there, there is no need for glycogen. But when you are fasting, when you are taking any food at all, you are stored glycogen molecule in muscle, stored glycogen molecule in the liver, that should be broken down to glucose. There is no need to action of insulin at that time. So what physiological reaction is the glycogen is being broken down to glucose by a glucagon hormone and the glucagon, where the glucagon will activate, glucagon is, an, is a hormone that is produced from pancreas, alpha islet of pancreas 
and thereby it is going to be activated on the liver, it is going to be on the blood and blood to the liver and the liver cell they have the receptors. The receptors is G protein coupled receptors which is having the alpha, beta and gamma subunit attached to it. As soon as this glucagon binds to the receptors, you get the beta and gamma subunit separated out and alpha is attached to GTP molecule, right? And the GTP will, alpha GTP will go and attack on the adenylate cyclase enzyme which will produce AMP, cyclic AMP from ATP and that cyclic AMP now activate protein kinase and that is going to be converted to the phospho, uh, phospho, phospholate kinase B from inactive form to active form and this will activate from phosphorylase B into phosphorylase A within the active form in presence of ATP and it sustains the reaction and then it will convert the glycogen into the glucose. That's what it is happening. At the same time, you don't want the phosphorylase to become inactive because we always want this active, active, active. What this protein kinase will do? It will activate the inhibitoring process. It activates the phospho protein inhibitor and thereby it inhibits this process. It inhibits this process and thereby the phosphate is not being removed so you will get more of glucose. Once this glucose is being produced more in a quantity from glycogen, storehouse from liver and then what will happen there is no need and, the, and, and, and automatically you get the blood glucose level determine shut off the gluca glucagon level and thereby this process is being shut off and you will get a normal, back to the normal glycogen storehouse. And when you eat more of that from external resources, this process will be facilitated. What is that? Glycogen synthase. Okay. And this process, the glucagon, in, in, in an indirect way, it can also inhibit this process because we need only glucose, not glucose to glycogen. So it also inhibits. The glucagon inhibit this process, glycogen synthase. And the glycogen synthase is being activated by uh, insulin. Okay. So I'll, uh, I'll write it in a, in a way like um, glycogen to glucose and glucose to glycogen. And this is the phosphorylase A. Okay, the phospho phosphate group is attached to it. And this is called glycogen synthase enzyme. And this is enzyme is being inhibited by inhibited by glucagon, glucagon, and which has been activated by insulin. So so, and thereby, glucose to glycogen is facilitated by insulin. At the same time, glycogen to glucose, that is being also, you know, glucagon inhibit this process. And also, uh, through cyclic AMP, it inhibits the phosphorylation of this process. So, you have a, a constant supply of glycogen to glucose. Do you follow the mechanism? It's, it's very simple, but if you understand the different, different uh, topics of the activation, it's, 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 it's easy to understand the process. Okay. Now, the next one is the how the glucagon, that, that insulin, that will, will activate in a, in, a, in, a, in a molecular mechanism. Glucagon, that's what is different between the glucagon and the insulin. Glucagon, 29 amino acids. Okay. They are produced as peptide hormone, which I we discussed earlier, and they are stored in vesicles. And this activation through GPCR, what? G protein coupled receptors, GPCR. Okay, now we have to study about insulin. What is insulin all about? Insulin is produced as a free pro insulin pro insulin free pro insulin okay and that produced like a 100 amino acids this one and then it is going to be cleaved you know divided and then uh, this 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 pro uh, hormone 
or the pro-insulin is a larger peptide and then it is going to break down into smaller peptide like a, like a 21 amino acids in one chain, another one is the 30 amino acids, uh, uh, another chain, these are 30 amino acids and 21 amino acids, it has been linked with a disulfide bridge and this is actual insulin molecule, 51 amino acids, this is insulin molecule. And they are also stored in vesicles. Okay. And insulin, they have the, uh, the receptors, the insulin binding receptor, just like uh, we call it GPCR in the glucagon. And the insulin, they have a different type of receptors. Let us see that receptors in a, in a short period of time. Now here the lipid bilayer membrane, they have a four subunit, alpha, beta, another alpha and beta here. So the alpha, alpha, and beta, and beta. So this is the uh, outside the cell. Outside, this is the cytosol, cytosol inside the beta. Okay. There, the insulin can bind here. One molecule of insulin, another molecule of insulin. It'll bind over here. As soon as it binds, just like a G protein coupled receptors, and this mechanism is different. It as the receptors have both function, it binds with the receptor, binds with the insulin. Also, it acts as an enzyme. This have an enzyme unit over there, and this enzyme we call it as a tyrosine kinase. Tyrosine kinase enzyme. So. Just like the glucagon, which we studied, cyclic AMP and adenylate cyclase, right? So here, the receptor itself will have one part is binding, another part is an enzyme. Okay? So receptor, enzyme. And this is the four. So we call it as these protein, as a tetramer receptor. Tetramer receptor. I put receptor enzyme, receptor enzyme. See, the enzymes are present in the cytosolic fraction and receptor protein which is present over there. So, it always binds with a one protein molecule or one receptor, but you have a four subunit, two alpha subunits and two beta subunit and beta subunit in cytosol and alpha subunit is outside the cell as acting as a receptor for insulin. And the tyrosine kinase, okay, it has the phosphorylation addition, tyrosine kinase. It has the many targets of this tyrosine kinase, okay? And both the glucagon and the insulin, they, both of them, they, they involve in phosphorylation reaction, which we have studied earlier. Phosphorylation reaction. Both glucagon and insulin. Glucagon and the insulin act on phosphorylation reaction in different pathways, okay? And they activate very different mechanism. As I mentioned before, glucagon activates in one side to sustaining the cell, uh, whereas the insulin also will act in a different pathway and thereby maintaining the homeostasis of the glucose. Okay, so this part, which we will uh, we will finish the glucose uh, metabolism in a, in a way how that will uh, that will make uh, in in an extra level, you know, when we study. Uh, just uh, I want to show you how this homeostasis of the glucose regulation. You see this uh, flash one. Um, you can see that one here. Look at this. Glucose homeostasis. This is a normal level, 75 to 100 milligram per 100 ml in the blood. So in, in between the eating, pancreas secretes glucagon. Adipose tissue break down. And now after eating more insulin secrete and the insulin activate in different cells and thereby it gives the balance. So if I do this, uh, what is called seesaw, right? Is a seesaw puzzle? Yeah. In between eating, glucagon secrete and liver produce more of glucose, so you maintain the glucose level, 75 to 100, 110 milligram per 100 ml blood. Okay. So when you eat more high blood glucose level, that will go here, right? And 
it activate insulin and thereby it, 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 it store excess glucose and thereby it maintain the high glucose level. It, if it is a low blood glucose level, it activates pancreas. High glucose level activates pancreas, but the enzyme, uh, sorry, for the hormone is different. Here insulin and here you find the glucagon. So the action just exactly the opposite. So the phosphorylation, one, it's not, uh, uh, it's for everything. For, for, for example, glucagon phosphorylation is different towards the production of glucose, whereas the insulin phosphorylation that activate the accumulation of glucose or the uh, produce a synthesis of glucose polymer into glycogen uh, or in the storehouse. So that is a part which you need to understand now. So what I need to do, I have to stop here and let us uh, go for the next week um, of um, finishing of some thyroid hormones are the stress related hormones okay and then we will have a high stress to prepare for the exam or you have a good stress for going out for the spring break right after the after that week right so next week we will cover maximum on the hormone and that's the end of it okay <laughs>